Welcome to our series, Perspectives on Post-COVID-19 Economy. Today, we will meet with two of our alumni who represent the business development function at their company. Business development is a critical business function because these are the people who make revenues happen. And in times like these, when revenues are threatened, their role becomes even more critical. First, Michelle Leyden Lee, Vice President of Global Marketing, Global Foundries, US Inc. Michelle is a highly successful marketing and sales leader who has created and grown some of the most iconic global brands in the high technology industry. Michelle is part of a leadership team that's responsible for over $6 billion in annual revenue and 16,000 employees. For much of the past two decades, Michelle has held executive positions in product marketing, product management, and sales in the semiconductor industry, including leadership roles at Qualcomm, Zilog, and Intel. Michelle earned her JD degree from UC Davis in 1993. She then returned to UC Davis to earn her MBA in 1995, and uh, also has a bachelor's degree in fine and studio arts in 1985 from State University of New York College at Purchase. Michelle is a member of Society of Women Engineers, the California Bar Association, and the Dean's Advisory Council. Our second panel speaker today is Randy Lee, who is an MBA from UC Davis Graduate School of Management. He's also the Vice President of Business Development Americas for Tencent Holdings. His responsibilities include investments, licensing, developing uh, partner relations, and strategic growth initiatives for all things gaming and entertainment related. Prior to Tencent, Randy was a VP of Global Business Development at Crowdstar a Time Warner Intel Capital backed leader in mobile games. Randy led CrowdStar's expansion internationally, managed their strategic platform partnerships and other distribution and licensing initiatives. Randy earned his MBA from UC Davis in 2000. He also holds a bachelor's degree in engineering from Santa Clara University. Please join me in giving a warm Graduate School of Management welcome to our panel members tonight. We had a, a, a good view early on of sort of what was going on, and we were keeping a pulse, um, you know, through through our crisis management um, organization. And we've had that in place for a while, right? Because you know we have fabs all around the world, and and as most big companies do have um, have a task force around that on a, on an ongoing basis in case in case things arise. Um, and so Global Foundries was actually one of the very first companies to tell folks that didn't need to be in an office go home and stay home. And we did that probably about a week before California, before Governor Newsom announced the stay at home order um, and certainly before Governor Cuomo did in New York as well. So we were very proactive in that approach. And our CEO, I think, made a great call and his, his call was, listen, first and foremost is the safety of our employees and our people. Because unless we have our employees and our people safe and happy and productive, we can't do anything. And, and I think that's that's just an amazing uh, amazing step of leadership for me in the industry. One of the reasons I love the company, and I'm I'm very committed to staying with the company. And I think it's it's borne itself out. Now, one of the things that he did, I know right away, as did our leadership team and uh, many of us, was reach out to our customers and our partners and find out what they were doing and how they were handling things and ask questions and have them ask us questions as well. It, it really, it's really fascinating to watch what happens at times like these, but I think it really was an opportunity in the middle of this crisis to come together and really partner with the people around us, our customers, our partners, our vendors, and try to help each other through this. Um, and I, and that's what we did, in fact. And so we listened to what our customers were saying. They, they asked us about how we were handling the situation with our employees and, you know, the other constituents around us. And so a lot of what I did in the first 10 days was listen to what, you know, I was hearing from customers and partners and vendors and other folks around me. And then starting to slowly step into place what, you know, what Global Foundries was making some decisions about. The other thing that was very important to me and important to our company overall was taking care of our employees. So listening to my team, making the team feel comfortable. Um, you know, this was, again, it was unprecedented for all of us. And so it was not unusual that people were nervous and apprehensive and concerned, uh, you know, not just for themselves and their livelihood, but their families, their health. I mean, again, this is a, this is a, a crazy time that we live in and, and, and it really is, you know, none of us had a 
playbook for this. So I think more than anything with listening and then trying to do the right thing for people and their families, both from a customer partner, vendor perspective, and certainly from an employee and an employer relationship perspective. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Randy, what about you? Yeah, it was interesting because as Michelle had a heartbeat over in New York, we actually had a heartbeat over in, in China. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there about a week before Chinese New Year, which was right when they went to lockdown because they didn't want everyone traveling. And so when I came back, you know, I heard about the lockdown happening in, in China. And in the U.S. side, you know, that's mid-January. We were still kind of business as usual. So we were moving forward like everything uh, normal because our biggest heartbeats for, for our team is uh, E3 in June which is a gaming conference and the GDC in March, uh, global, uh, the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco. So we were planning as is, we have basically a, a, a big investee summit where we invite all our investees uh, for the weekend at Carvalho Point, which is just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And then we go into a week of meetings and these are like from breakfast all the way through dinner and then night meetings with partners. So it's, it's literally five days of, of meetings. So we were just planning as normal and, you know, and seeing kind of what was happening in China, we started thinking about, okay, what happens if this gets impacted here? Because we started hearing our, our Japan team, our Korea teams, our China teams, they weren't going to come anymore, but we were going to move forward as is um, and have our Western investees and our Western meetings happen. So kind of seeing it start to happening and then trying to plan was kind of a difficult position. But ultimately, as you know, we, we made the choice, uh, we made the call before GDC canceled and said, you know what? We're not going to have everyone fly in and and have these meetings. Um, so from a from a business standpoint, we ended up doing everything online, right? All the meetings we had booked, everything went virtual. We had kind of the the, the ten cent team and kind of the the studio teams and all the different companies we met with. Everything happened online. So that week was basically like we were at GDC, but the meetings were stacked up all online. Uh, so we we kept that going. We canceled our virtual summit and we uh, or the the actual investee summit at Carlo Carvalho point and made that a virtual summit. So we did a thing where we invited everyone into a, a zoom uh, meeting and we actually talked about what we did in China, because as we were, as the U S is going into lockdown, China was actually coming out and we were sharing kind of knowledge of what we saw, what we did to our investees. Um, so that was kind of the first two things. As Michelle mentioned, the team was really important. Like I, I made sure we, Instead of bi-weekly team meetings, we did weekly team meetings because we just wanted to make sure everyone felt they were um, involved and still kind of going the same direction as the group. And I think, you know, certain uh, some of some people on my team, they're, they're not with their families, right? They're in the Bay Area by themselves living with a roommate or in their in their apartment. And it gets very lonely, right? If you can't go go to the office because we're a pretty tight group uh, in, in the team and also within the office. So just over communicate with with the teams. Um, and then I guess the last thing was within Tencent America, we actually, Tencent started a, a, a COVID-19 fund. It was a $100 million fund. We ended up having separate groups um, forming to cover different regions and looking for hotspots. So we had done a, a thing with uh, the New England Patriots and, and Robert Kraft got his plane systems in and our people were kind of got all these K95 uh, masks and was able to get it to his plane. He was able to get it to Boston we had a big shipment to New Orleans, right? Another hot spot. So um, we were playing kind of whack-a-mole, trying to figure out who needs PPE where. Uh, and as North America was doing ours, the Europe team was doing theirs and we were shipping things all throughout Italy and, and Germany. Um, so it was a, so I would say probably 30%, 40% of the time was on kind of the COVID-19 relief fund effort of logistics. We actually had a whole bunch of stuff shipped to our Palo Alto office as storage. And then from there, like Stanford, came to our office and, and took a whole bunch of things out. Um, so that was 30, 40% of the time. And the other time, I would say 20% of the time is making sure the team is good and we're all kind of uh, in, in line with what we're working on. And then the last part is spending the time doing Zoom meetings and, and with partners. So that was kind of how we broke things out. Thank you. It's very interesting when I hear both of you talk about how the first instinct for you was to take care of your team. I almost look at this as, you know, when you have the same kind of a crisis as you face in a family, the first thing we talk about is taking care of our own, just to make sure that our family is doing all right. And and uh, that almost looks like the first steps you have taken as well. The work itself is like a family for you, took care of them. And then once those things are settled, you'll start looking at, well, what next should I do? And that, that's where I started thinking about, well, what happens after you have just settled down to what the new situation is. 
are there some parts of your company, for example, that seem to be less affected or unaffected by the crisis? For example, Randy, your company is into gaming, and we hear that gaming is on the rise during this lockdown. Or Michelle, there are certain products that have grown, grown in sales, like disposable gloves. Sales went up 700% and need more machines to produce them, which may need the chips you're making. Did you see any patterns on the types of businesses that seem to be resistant to the crisis? And if you were to summarize the characteristics of these business areas that resist crises like this, what would those characteristics be? And I'll start with Randy on this one. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, you know, the gaming side, it's, it's pretty well known now that during this shelter in place, the gaming business is booming across the board. If you look at just the, the public traded companies of Activision, Take Two, EA, like they're all trading at 52 or all time highs, uh, including 10, 10, you know, 10 cents done very well on, on the gaming business. So, you know, people are sheltering in place. It's a very low cost way to entertain. Um, I sit on a board with uh, somebody else in the kind of linear movie space uh, down in LA. And you look at that in contrast, we're all servicing consumers, right? But our consumers are at home uh, and with shelter in place, it's been booming. But for him, it's been very difficult, right? Because filming has stopped completely. They had to push out all their uh, theatrical launch windows and of, of movies and kind of reschedule everything. Um, so it's, it's been very hard for kind of the linear theatrical business, uh, very strong for, for gaming companies and you know, Netflix, Hulu, and every, all the other streaming companies of just absorbing content. Uh, we have an investee that uh, has a, a car series, uh, an animation series, I guess I should say, on Netflix called The Dragon Prince. Um, and they just re-upped for another four years because they are right now just looking for content. Um, so it's, uh, I think it depends what parts of the business you're in. You know, for us, the ad business for, our, uh, for Tencent has, was actually has, has gone down, right? So a lot of the big brand ads uh, in China through the WeChat platform of, you know, luxury goods, you know, those type of things. Like there's no call to action of, of anyone wanting to buy a BMW in China during the lockdown or even in the U.S. now no one's really going to run those ads, right? Because people aren't going to go out and do those things. So, uh, you know, certain parts of the business <clears throat> has boomed and other, other parts is kind of lagging behind. Right. And Michelle? Yeah, very, very similar feedback. So, you know, for example, we're doing this now over Zoom, right? So anything that includes, you know, video conferencing, connectivity, I mean, you know, with all the children home, you know, kind of around the world for a while, um, doing online school where that was possible. Um, so PCs, you know, there was, we saw a kind of surge in, in PC volume go back up due to this, right? People getting the infrastructure to work from home, do school from home and so forth. Um, anything around connectivity folks. So, you know, as we look forward to 5G, for example, the 4G to 5G transition, that seems to be accelerated again, driven by a lot of folks online and, and just having to do everything virtually. Um, Medical, for sure. So, you know, we sell into the medical segment um, and there's more and more innovations happening in medicine with things like, you know, um, portable ultrasound machines that are, that are used actually in the detection of COVID for the lungs and other things like that that are increasingly filled with silicon, right, for things like AI and edge device connectivity for medical. So we see definitely um, um, that segment strong. There are other segments, however, that you know definitely have been impacted. Automotive is is for sure one of them, um, as, as Randy mentioned. Um, so it 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 seemed to be kind of um, you know a, a bit of a balance, right? Of a, a trade off. There's some areas that are that are that are increasing demand based on what's going on. There's others that are suffering. And what's interesting is I don't think you can really correlate crisis to crisis, this particular crisis has its own set of kind of unique characteristics and then how you manage that is really going to, to differ depending on what situation you find yourself in. But you know, what we've tried to do is kind of look at what the, um, what the dynamics of the current crisis are and manage those as best we can based on the outlook over the next you know, six months to a year. A lot of that is still uncertain. Right, but again, it just takes um, kind of daily um, review and uh, as best we can balancing the, the dynamics. Yeah, in fact, uh, one of the articles I was reading was saying that uh, any business that depends on revenue from where people congregate 
would be negatively affected and any supplier to those businesses would also be affected. So if you think of something like uh, a company that's providing salad, 40% uh, of the salad is sold through restaurant chains around the country. And so restaurants rely on people coming together. And uh, when a restaurant is not able to do its business, the salad a producer also will not be able to supply 40% of the salad because that's where it used to go. So that seems to be the general trend. And, and it was also interesting for me to read uh, a LinkedIn article that started talking about opportunities that are coming out of this because of uh, uh, the new needs that are being expressed in, in the country. The article talked about Walmart uh, hiring uh, 50,000 uh, new workers for distribution and fulfillment centers because people are ordering a lot more stuff online or picking up on, at the curb. FedEx is hiring 35,000 people. Taco Bell is hiring 30,000 people to work at restaurants and uh, supply people because it's one of the restaurants that apparently seem to be seeing an increase in demand for its price uh, probably. Ace Hardware is hiring people, Pizza Hut is hiring people, Lowe's is hiring people. I was just surprised to see all these companies that are now doing business, which is more than what they did before the crisis. And it looks like there are some opportunity areas that are opening up just based on you know, those kinds of articles. But yeah. uh, it, it's, it's interesting, it's, let me, uh, just it, if I can just add like, yeah. We never imagined this would happen right in our lifetime that we would all be sheltering in place and there's this global virus that's kind of shut down everything. But we also will never imagine that what if the internet goes down and there's no, and there's a virus that's going through the internet that everyone has to shut down and we have to block it. Then literally all the online gaming company stocks are going to be tanking and all the, the brick and mortar stores are going to be booming, right? So it's, uh, you know, you never know, right? And uh, that's right. This is you a, know. a lesson for us to learn. That's right. Yeah, it's, all, it's also a lesson in resiliency because if you look at what's going on and maybe it's, I tend to be Glass, glass half full versus glass half empty person anyway. But if you look at some of the new business models that are being spur, spurred from this, so you you mentioned the the restaurant business. My husband happens to be in the restaurant business. So the, the new business models that are coming out of this and creative thinking of how do we do things differently to keep our revenue up or you know continue to do business. And I think you see that actually across a lot of different um, industries right now. And, and there are certainly going to be industries that suffer much worse than others, but it's interesting to watch the creative process for some of those industries that find new business models out of this. And I think it's a lesson for all of us, you know, even when we're not in the middle of a crisis to continue to look to innovate around business models, because that's really where you spur growth. I mean, it's the old, you know, blue ocean strategy, right? And, and how do you do that, even at times not of crisis? How do you keep your mind thinking in that direction? It's, it's, it's actually very fascinating. Right, the last 10 years, there's like companies like Uber and Lime Bikes, right? Those are billion dollar businesses. Mm -hmm. Lime Bikes, I have a friend over there in corp, corporate, corp dev, right? Like they just had a massive layoff and it, like who's gonna be using other people's bikes, the share economy of, of kind of, you know, everyone's hands touching a, a motorized scooter now. That's why the traditional bicycle sales is booming. You can't find a bike under $500 at any bike store anymore because everyone wants to have their own bike. Um, so that, that last 10 years of this booming growth of the gig economy yeah. is now figuring out now they need to figure out a new business model because that right. one may not work in this yeah. new economy. And that yeah. is interesting you say that because a year ago I was uh, asked about a prediction to make as to what's going to happen. And I uh, was saying that from a consumer behavior perspective, the whole concept of ownership that we grew up with, we wanted our own car, we wanted our own house and so on. There was a matter of pride there to own something. And then there's this new generation of people coming. I'll go and sleep in anybody's house if it saves me a hundred bucks because I don't need a hotel or I'll, I'll uh, drive in somebody else's car because I don't need to buy my own. That notion of, I don't care who owns it, I just want to use it because I don't need to own it was the mindset. And now that we have these new fears coming up, ownership seems to probably be coming back again as yes. the right thing to do, which is very interesting uh, to see the change happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So let me ask you another question then. Uh, and and that, that's actually very refreshing to hear that also from you, how uh, these kinds of crises you know, they of course have negative impact on several people, 
but they also have a positive side to it because people start coming up with creative ideas uh, to, to start new business models, new businesses and so on, which will redefine how we live our lives. And, and that's, that's the part that's really intriguing. Uh, and I was re- re- reading through another article that was telling me that uh, we know about all these companies, uh, little restaurants going out of business and so on, and, and, and we are concerned about that. But uh, every year, normal year in America, 750,000 small businesses are bankrupting. So they go bankrupt and, and then new businesses come in. So this 750,000 businesses going out of business is normal in the United States every year. It just so happens that it happened in a compressed period of two months. Mm. And that's where I think there is a, a concern as to you know what's going on. But it's a very normal thing where we are coming up with new models, new ideas, new ways of doing things. We are just being forced into doing that within two months. And that's probably what is causing some concern as well, which is an interesting uh, perception issue here. Uh, so I'll, I'll go back to uh, Michelle for this question. So there are companies like yours, Michelle, who sell to other companies. So your demand is what I call a derived demand. Because so, if your customers lose sales, you do too. Randy, for your company, there is a large segment of end consumers. So your demand is more direct. And let's focus on that segment, like the gaming industry, let's say. How do you react to crises like this one in these two different scenarios? What are the things you need to pay attention to as a business development leader in each situation? For example, you know, do you treat your business customer any differently from the end customer? Or how do you even approach this problem, uh, depending on whether you are dealing with a business customer who's selling to somebody else versus you are selling directly to the end customer. Uh, start with Michelle. Sure. Um, certainly this heightens that distinction, but I think anytime you have a B2B business, right, we're selling to businesses who sell uh, to their, their customers. It could be an end user, it could be another business. But I think you, you can't lose the fact that it's in some ways it's similar to sell, selling to a consumer, right? It's all about what you can afford and what you can sell through. From a consumer's perspective, you're always looking at your budget. What can I afford? And what's the value I derive from whatever I'm buying? And is the value worth more than, you know, than what I have to pay? Um, and do I have it within my budget? When it's a B2B type of relationship like, like our company, we're looking at what is the value that our client or our customer derives from what we're selling. And that value proposition is really critical because when we, when we derive that, we're not just looking at who we're selling to our client, we're looking at their client. We're like, we're looking out through the chain to say what value can we add that allows us to help our client with the sell through so that we understand that they're going to actually be able to sell through to their customer and therefore value what we have to bring. And we do that on a regular basis, not just during times like these, right? So it's critical for us when we put that, that customer really at the heart of our business to not only stand, understand our customers' needs, but their customers' needs and be able to show a value pull all the way through to that need or that requirement um, out at their customer. And as I said, that's not just something during this crisis time. We do that on a regular basis. Now that said, this is a special time. And so you can only control so much. So you have to look at what you can control. You want to make sure that you're offering that value and you see that pull through and you can, you can articulate that clearly. But then we also have to step back and look at our own business and make sure, just like a consumer, that we have our budget under control and our costs under control, right? Because that is what we can directly control. So we have to do both of those things during this time. We have to make sure that we're deriving value for our, our customers that create a pull through for them and that that value is still you know, clear and understood and meaningful even during this time. And then we also have to look at our own shop and the co- and our costs. And we have to make sure that that, that cost is, is kept under control and we're monitoring and we're understanding you know, what the outlook looks like six months, a year. And we run some scenario ar- analysis around that, what ifs, right? Because right now I think we're, we're all in the situation where we don't really know what is gonna happen for sure, for certain, but we can make some judgments you know, what would be the worst case, what would be the best case and run some scenario planning around that and start to then run the business based on that. So let me I just ask a follow up to that because it, so there's software and then there is manufacturing and you're kind of in a manufacturing area. So yeah. one of the principles of manufacturing is that you don't want to uh, 
keep varying the production levels because that will add a lot of cost to your manufacturing. And so you would like not to shut down something or, you know, if you want to go low a little bit, you have to keep going low for a while until you really know that you want to ramp up the production and so on. So do you see um, those constraints uh, constraining your actions uh, as well uh, in terms of what you can do? Yeah, there's certainly, we certainly have to keep that into account, take that into account for sure. So you're talking about you want level loading, mm-hmm. right, through anything that you're doing. And, and there's a certain loading um, target that you want to hit for, to keep your cost optimized, right? And so certainly that's something that we look at. Um, there are ways of managing that without like a hard shutdown. So you're, 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 you're managing kind of the trade-offs there. Um, you can idle some points of the line, for example, um, for, for a given amount of time and, and do some cost savings there or certainly keep, uh, keep the, uh, the, the, the line consistent without, uh, even if you have a, a lower level of fill or lower level of um, demand. So there, there's, there's a lot of that scenario, that's part of that scenario pl- planning, right? And looking at, at the capacity um, how your wh- what your demand is through the line and what the demand profile looks like out six months to a year, right? And and make some of those trade offs. But yes, that's those are all things that we have to take into account for sure um, when you're dealing with a manufacturing line. Thanks there, and Randy. Yeah, I think you know it's um, uh, we are a, a B two C business, right? Gaming is is is, is to consumers. Um, just as, as I mentioned earlier, so is Disney selling movies, but we're all in very different situations because of COVID-19. So, um, you know, for us, we've done quite a few things. And, and I feel like gaming is one of these where you, the fans, the community is so important um, and how you engage with them, whether it's with COVID or not. It's just engaging with the community is, is so critical. And especially at this time where, whereby there's just a, a big influx of new users with existing players uh, and people wanting more and more and more. So I think there's a couple of different avenues we look at. The first would be kind of just within the game, right? How do we, how do we uh, kind of adapt to what the user base wants? And simple things like, like I mentioned, maybe a whole bunch of new users coming in. How does the new user fit with matchmaking with kind of the old users and what they want in the game and being able to adapt very agilely um, with the kind of the, the direction of where the game is and what's being updated in, into the game. Um, I think, you know, th- with these fans, it, we have to do other things to engage with them. So obviously the economy uh, where it is and the unemployment rate, we also have to be very careful on what we offer to the consumers and, and making sure that there's a balance between fun and monetization, right? And it's always like that. There's certain games out there that really monetize extremely high, but it's also very difficult, you know, when, when it's tough times for, for players to be able to pay. So um, these are all very different balances we, we take within the ecosystem. Um, that we have to watch. You know, one of our close partners is Wizards of the Coast. They do the Magic of the Gathering uh, card game. And they have an online version where that's, it's doing very well. But they also had a, have a card version whereby on the weekends, Friday nights, let's say people go to these hobby shops all over the country, all over the world to play these, these card games, uh, play, play Magic. And these card shops all had to close down. It's, 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 and that really hurts Wizards because now you can't sell physical card packs. Uh, because these places are closed and they may not be able to recover. So they did in-game activities whereby, you know, the, the online players in the community could actually donate and then donate the money through Wizards to the actual store in their neighborhood, right? And these are things I think we have to look at as, as kind of the gaming ecosystem. How do we help the different channels, right? Because now you have an online kind of gaming company really trying to help offline kind of small retail, mom and pop hobby stores and it's critical to the business. No one would have ever thought in the world of gaming and everyone's online and these massive games that you'd actually have to support these hobby stores, but everything's kind of interconnected. So um, I guess, I guess for us, uh, we have to be totally in tune with the community, kind of uh, make sure that it's almost like what we talked about in the beginning, make sure, you know, make sure the team's okay. We also have to make sure the community's okay and then give them what they need and what they want uh, at a level and also try to give back. It's very interesting because on one hand, it's B2C and B2B that we talked about, but there was it was kind of an undercurrent that both of you have expressed where you want to take care of the customer. And I, I, I recall many years ago uh, reading about uh, Ray Kroc when he first started his uh, 
uh, his McDonald's uh, in Chicago. Uh, the first winter was a really bad winter and uh, the brothers just didn't have the money to buy the meat uh, to run the restaurant. And uh, they were willing to shut down and there would not have been a McDonald's uh, that, that we would know as, as, as we know today. But the, the butcher who was across the street from uh, the McDonald's restaurant told them that most restaurants go through this crisis. Uh, don't worry about it. I'll give you the meat right now. You can pay me later when you start making money. And McDonald's, uh, Ray Kroc never left them after that. He continued to have them be the meat supplier forever because he grew and they grew into billions of dollars worth of stuff. So it's kind of interesting to see those stories. And, and when I look at both of you telling me what you're doing, I'm also wondering, do you see any opportunities now in how you take care of your customer that are going to help you post-crisis? Uh, starting with Michelle. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I certainly think how we engage the customer, you know, it's just like how we engage each other during this crisis, right? The, it, it's very interesting, actually, if you think about if you think about sales, I mean, typically sales, a lot of sales are done in person, right? You go to the customer, customer's office, you, you know, talk in person, you have meetings in person, you, you work together, you do engineering, you solve engineering problems in person. And so our sales force has now been completely, almost completely put online acro across the globe. I mean, things are starting to open up, for example, in China and, and, and in Taiwan, but more and more today, even now with some of the concerns, there's still a lot that now we have to do virtually. And how do you still get that, that personal touch? And I think it's all about making sure that people feel like you care about them and it's, you're sincere about it. And so I think really that's, that's the approach to, to always approach your customer, not just during a time like this, but it heightens it with care and concern. Because at the end of the day, if your customer is not seeing value in what you bring, you don't really understand what their needs are and, and want to help them. That, that's what the customer relationship is all about, right? It, it just is. And so you, you have to do that consistently. And I think this, a time like this just tightens the company, the companies that do that really well will do well. And the co companies that don't do that well, I think the, the disconnect is even more apparent in situations like this. So we just have to, you have to continue to put the customer at the heart of everything that you do. Right, and, and Randy, when you said that there is this balance between fun and monetization, that was where I was thinking, wow, you really are looking after the customer while also trying to sell them the product. And so that's what led me to ask that question of you. So are there some opportunity areas that you see when you see this kind of a crisis develop? I guess there's, if I look at it, there's the, there's the player base, there's the players. So as a game operator, kind of what we need to do there. And then there's kind of the businesses we work with. Uh, let me start with the businesses we work with first. So those would be, you know, my, my primary focus on the investment side is we have a big portfolio of investees that we've invested in. The big companies and the ones that have live games out, they're all doing very well. And they're all raising money at this point because everyone, you know, in a time of crisis, um, and if you have the ability to raise money, and if right now a lot of these companies are doing very well, they're raising money and they're going to get the money that they, they need to kind of get them through the next hurdle, whatever that may be. So that one, those, those groups, um, they're doing fine, right? There's this kind of this other group, which is they were, you know, they're probably, they raised money a few years back and now they're looking for a, a publisher. They, maybe they haven't launched the game yet, so they don't have any revenue. And those ones are the ones I think right now from, from a Tencent perspective, we have to kind of take care of, right? Because those are the ones, you know, we invested in them a few years ago. We liked the vision, we liked the direction, we liked the team, and they did everything they were supposed to do. Um, just like all these other businesses, right? The, the people that are opening and working hard and all of a sudden, you know, no GDC, no meetings, publishers aren't signing any more deals. We can't get a playable. We can't, you know, get a play test. And they're going, great, great. Now my, uh, my burn, I'm just, you know, I'm going to chew up three, four, six months of my time and I don't have the runway for that. And those are the ones are the ones that we have to kind of spend time with. Um, there was a, a specific one that we've helped bridge uh, for a little bit to just help them out to get through it because, everything fundamentally is still exactly what they said they would do and what they're delivering. And it's just, it's unfortunate that this kind of hit and all their publishing kind of meetings and, and the deals that they were going to sign. Cause on a business perspective right now, things have slowed down from signing deals because you just can't meet teams and kind of 
things. Um, so those are the ones we have to be more careful with and just, just really pay close attention and be good partners with. On the consumer front, yeah, it's kind of what, what, what I mentioned earlier. We just, it's just, it's a balance there. Uh, I think any type of give back to the community, people appreciate. And, and these fans, there's always the vo very vocal minority, um, but you just have to, they're also your most passionate fans. So it's, uh, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, we had a, we have, we're an invest, uh, invest uh, one of our investees is Reddit. And, you know, Reddit, and you can find anything and everything in Reddit, uh, you know, positive fans, negative, like it's just, it's a, and it's a, it's a very difficult place to, to manage. Um, and it's very hard when you have a, a brand that people are so passionate about, they want so much, and you have to make sure that they, they're taken care of. Yeah. So I, maybe I can make one other comment because I, I agree with actually everything that Randy said. It's very interesting because I, I really think there is a corollary B2B. I mean, one of the things that we've seen is some of our smaller mid-sized customers don't always have the reach that we have. And even during this time, they want to get visibility. In fact, we had one, one customer that actually launched and they were in stealth mode and they came out publicly. And one of the things that we did was said, okay, well, we probably have a broader reach than you do in terms of you know, media and press and some of our social channels. We'll just elevate. We'll do a joint promotion with you and we'll elevate your, your release. And it was very easy for us to do. Um, it was probably low to no cost for us, save for some kind of my time and my team. And, and they were so appreciative because they could get much more lift than they would have gotten on their own. So it's, it's just little things like that where you can, you can reach out and help. We've seen the same, by the way, to, from our customers back to us. I mean, interestingly, we had a customer that actually donated to us for, uh, at, at, it was out of China, for the U.S., N95 masks for us to do a donation and give back to the communities we were in. So we've seen, we've seen it both ways. We've seen customers come to us and reach out with things like that. And we've tried to reach out and return to other customers and help them with things that are relatively easy for us to do, but have a big impact on their business. That's very interesting because what you both are saying is, this is also a time where by doing the right things, the bond between the company and the customer actually can be strengthened, which is a great opportunity for us, which is not normal because in normal times, a lot of competition, there's a lot of noise going on in the system. Here with everything else quietened down, it's just the customer and you. And to be able to develop that trust in that customer now would result in long-term advantage for the company because that customer will stay with you knowing that you've helped them when they needed it. That's uh, right. So and what's interesting about that, and I always try to describe this to, to people who are new or, or young coming into the industry, is at the end of the day, it's about people. It's not about some monolithic company. It's just, it's about someone picking up the phone and having a relationship at every level in the company. The more relationships that you can build with your customers one-on-one, -on -one, with whoever your contact is there, and we see that from the CEO level all the way through the company, it's the people every day that get on the phone and have a conversation and try to help each other do their job. That is just such, those, those bonds are so important no matter where you are in the company. If you have a relationship, build and nurture that relationship because you never know when it's going to pay dividends for you. And, and by the way, it's just the right thing to do to help, to help your customers and your partners. Excellent, excellent. And, and I think uh, there was an answer uh, probably included in some of the things you said to a question I was going to ask you. Because what I wanted to ask you was, you know, you have uh, business to business uh, customers, and then let's say you can split them into two groups. There are the current customers, and then there are those who are, you know, warm and hot prospects. So you can almost look at them differently. You know, I can even imagine looking at the students who we have as our students right now in the programs and students who are going to join us or are thinking about join us next year. So that's similar kind of a split between the two groups. You have your customers and you have your prospects. And for this question, Randy, you know, please think of your business customers. Do you approach these two groups now, the prospects versus the current customers, any differently? Now, what would uh, be some actions you take with one group 
that you may not take with the other group? That is, do you have different strategies for the two groups of customers? Uh, maybe start with uh, Randy. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the current, if I look at kind of today's climate, I mean, the current customer base, um, you know, it's really important to under, really understand their strategy, right? Like, how, what is your plan? And I sit on a few of these boards, right? What is your plan right now? What is your plan with the team? How are you doing with the, your, your, uh, your funding? How are you doing with the, the execution? Does it slip? You just, we have to plan so far ahead. And, and I want to make sure that they can look ahead. Because a lot of times, I think, uh, for future prospects or, or, uh, or existing partners, it's, it's really important to kind of, you know, they're in the weeds a lot, right? Entrepreneurs, new people developing uh, new studios, they're always in the weeds. And it's really important that they tend to kind of look up and go, okay, look, these are big milestones. Can we hit them or not? And then what do I need to do to do that given this current situation? So we end up having them, um, you know, develop multiple plans. Uh, and it, it's a little bit of work, I think, for them, but ultimately it makes sense because what they do is it helps them focus and see things much more clearly. If, you know, if what's plan A, what's plan B in these two scenarios. So I think for the current customers or current, you know, investee partners, we, it's more about execution and being able to plan steps. And then we see how execution is and see what the steps look like to see how they can kind of ride through this wave. I think for prospects, uh, it's more about, you know, people know who we are in, in the gaming space. So I don't know if there's a, a whole lot of kind of uh, different uh, approach given the current situation, but usually what happens is in a time like this, and you could see it in the stock market of, of the big companies, the big mega caps, right? It's the guys with a lot of free cash flow um, that are going to sustain. And a lot of times they come out stronger than they were going in because anyone of the kind of the tier two, tier three competitors who aren't, don't have as strong as a balance sheet are going to get washed out. So I don't know if there's anything about um, you know, future prospects or future partners that we would approach anything different. If anything, you know, we're, we're doing less uh, kind of new meetings, but we're still, I mean, our strategy hasn't changed. We're still going down everything we're supposed to be doing and we're pushing the, 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 the pedal forward as quick as we can. So um, I think that's how I would approach the, the, the two, you know, the, the prospects, Let's keep moving. Let, let's uh, let's keep moving forward. This we're we're ten cent. We are what we are, and we're going to be uh, ahead of the industry when we get out of it. And then the uh, the current in investees is let's plan for A, B, and C, and see where the hiccups and hurdles could be that we can help fix it. Great, right. Michelle. Yeah, very very similar answer. I would I would say the same with your current clients. You know. It, 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 it's funny, you, you used to say in the industry, you know, if you, if you keep a client, awesome. If you lose a client, the amount of money you have to spend and the amount of time to get that client back is just so painful. You don't ever want that to happen. So the first and foremost, you want to keep the, the, the customers or the clients you have today very happy and in sync and help them through this. So planning, forecasting, really, and, and helping them do scenario planning themselves to kind of get through this time and really understanding where their business is going and being very strategic in terms of looking together at roadmaps and where we want to innovate together. I think when you do that really, really well, our industry is, is a very small industry. That word of mouth gets back to your, your, your prospects, right? And in fact, your current client, clients are your best uh, marketers, if you will, for you know new clients coming in, and so we try to keep the uh, treat the customers we have today really at a level of excellence, knowing that they are really our best references for the the prospects that we have in the future. Now, of course, we want to we want to take care of, of of new clients as well, right, as coming in, and but the best, as I said, I think the best way to do that is that current clients will then turn around. And you know, tell the world what a great experience they've had with you, and that that word of mouth is is better than than anything else. So we want to keep our, our clients happy, and then you know, hopefully they will turn around and tell others that um, we're the we're the partner you want to work with. Great, great. So in a way, uh, it also means that in terms of let's say the proportion of effort that you put into this uh, space a little bit more effort actually goes to keeping the customers than to go after new customers, especially in times like these. Am I saying it right? Uh, I, I think there's certainly always an effort in, in growing your customer base for sure, but you can't do that at the expense of your current customers, right? 
your current customers, you have to have a level of, of expertise and, um, and quality and um, that you, you just can't let that go. At, at, at times like these, especially because customers will remember, the Ray Kroc story was a great one, right? Because I think it, it's very telling. Customers will remember that you helped them through a, a hard time. Right. And if you just think of your own, you know, personal examples of, of a friend helping you through a crisis or a hard time, that that's something that that folks remember. Likewise, when you do really badly, customers remember that for a long, long time as well, or if you ignore them. Right. So you just don't want to do that. Um, you want to treat your customers well through a, through a crisis like this. And again, I think they're your best your best voice to those others who you want to bring in. Um, having a customer testimonial that just, you know, extols how well um, you, you've helped them through, through a hard time, it, it says a lot. And by the way, again, I think it's just the right thing to do. You know, if that customer is a good customer, the right thing to do is to help them as much as you can through this time. Excellent. Let me ask just one more question before we turn it over to our audience to ask questions. So any person involved in business development will need to make changes to address the current crisis. We discussed something so far on the approaches you took to address the fluid situation. If you, had, if you were to advise our, the current frontline business de development managers or potential new recruits on specific skills they should focus on to get through this crisis and beyond, what skills and certifications would you ask them to pursue? And if you were to advise our graduate students on some skills they should focus on, what would they be? Uh, long question. Uh, if there is anything unclear, I'll repeat it. Let me know. Uh, start with uh, Michelle. Well, certainly change management skills is always, a, is always excellent, no matter, you know, especially in, in the technology industry, right? Change is always happening. Uh, but especially in this kind of, of, of a situation, you know, flexibility and the ability to manage during a crisis and, and change management. So any kind of change man management certification or, you know, skills that you can learn for sure, that is, that is, those are critical. Um, I think the other thing that we're all learning, though, is that more, and actually Randy mentioned with a lot of conferences going online, for example, anything having to do with digital and virtual I think you know we're going to see long-lasting effects of this crisis, in my opinion, um, in how we market and how we we run things from a virtual standpoint. I think work from home or work at home uh, and the effect of that. Certainly, trade shows and events. I mean, we've had multiple trade shows, big trade shows in our industry this year, canceled or postponed. Uh, the big one was in Barcelona. Mobile World Congress was canceled this year in February. Um, I can't, I can't believe that that you know a conference organizer I know for a fact is looking. How do you do that differently in the future? Do we go to fully virtual? Do we go to hybrid virtual, uh, hybrid and virtual events, especially with social distancing? So you know you could have an in-person event, but if you need six feet apart, um, you know a a, yard, a large conference center that could hold you know. Uh, just making up 500, you know, 500 people maybe in a ballroom can now only hold a quarter of that with social distancing. So even if you want to have an in-person event, do you do a partial hybrid and do partial of that partially uh, virtual? Um, so I think the more that, you, that we all can learn about this brave new world of virtualization of things that we would just every day think that it's going to be in person, the same thing with, you know, sales. If you want to go into sales, learning to sell virtually, right? That is a skill that's very different than learning to sell or negotiate or close things in person. So I think those are all skills that we're all going to have to learn. That's interesting. Yeah, great. Randy? No, I guess for me, um, I still, I, I kind of fundamentally always look for the, the kind of four basic things I think about. You know, one is just kind of the passion for the industry, right? So whether it would be semiconductor, healthcare, gaming, movies, literature, whatever it would be, I, I think every candidate, every every potential employ, employee should should have understanding what they're passionate about because that really shows. I think when you're out there trying to kind of get in the door, look for an internship, is is showing that kind of passion for for the business, um, and that 
I mean, you're doing that because if you have a passion for it, you're probably doing something with it out of your regular time, right? Your work time. And that just keeps you, that just makes you kind of above everyone else. Um, the other one I think a lot about is just, you know, for business development, it's about, uh, there's different types, right? There's kind of the, what I call the hunter and there's the farmer. And the farmer is you have an account and how do you kind of crop, you know, and farm it every year and look for new opportunities within the account. And then there's hunters, which is like, you know, green fields, let's go out and hunt. Um, I think just in general, like if it's called business development, you're trying to develop business and sales and opportunities for the company. So you have to kind of be a hunter. And now it's even more difficult to be a hunter because you, know, you can't go anywhere. You can't fly to trade shows and meet people at events. So, you know, you, you, so the hunting kind of mentality is so critical in a normal business development role. It's even more critical now when it's all virtual and looking for opportunities. So, you know, so passion in, in the industry, the ability to uh, hunt for new opportunities, to think about new ways and, you know, new ways to work together, right? Always thinking about, oh, you know, this is what we do. This is a really cool partner. How do we work with them? What are, what are interesting ways and try to connect the dots? Um, I guess uh, uh, another one would just be um, kind of thinking, critical thinking. And this, you know, you don't need to, and I, I kind of think back of my days of back when I was at school, you know, I think my, my thinking level wasn't where it is today and it's just, it, it comes through experience. So like if I can help the people on the call, just have having them push the way they think about businesses, right? Because during this time of, of, of how different businesses are shifting, you know, if I was looking at the gaming business, there's so many big shifts coming in the gaming business with Google, with Stadia and streaming. How does streaming impact regular console and disc sales, right? And, and a, a company like GameStop, which isn't doing well doing physical retail sales. How does the next uh, Xbox or PlayStation <laughs> console launch coming this holiday going to impact kind of developers and the whole ecosystem? And these are things you have to spend the time. If, if you're passionate about the industry, you have to spend the time thinking about the big picture. Because if you look at the CEOs of these big companies, they're not looking at little deals here and there, right? They're thinking about the big shifts in the industry that's going to, if they miss it, could really crush a company. So they have to make sure they get it right, right? So I think the more that the, the folks on this call can think and learn to think about kind of the big shifts, the big shifts in the business, the better. And I'll ask a lot of questions about how, how I think about things and I'll ask, ask certain candidates, what do you think about this? <clears throat> and I don't really need them to come up with the right answer because really nobody knows, right? A CEO of Xbox and Phil Spencer would be very different than what Sony is gonna think, <coughs> excuse me. But I wanna see their mindset. I wanna see how they think about it, right? How do they problem solve and you know, take in information and kind of come out with a conclusion. That conclusion may not be right, but it doesn't matter. It just shows that they're critical thinking. So I think, you know, those couple of things are really critical, I think, for people to stand out in this kind of new, new way of interviewing. And, and just a clarification for me. So um, I, I, I remember when I first took my, my marketing course, uh, there was an anecdote that was communicated to me, which was uh, a sales manager sent two of uh, uh, his salespeople to a remote island where he wanted to sell footwear, which is what they were making. The first salesperson wrote back saying, hey, I looked around, nobody here wears any slippers or sandals, so there is no market, uh, fly me back. And the second person wrote back saying, oh my God, this is entirely ours, nobody wears sandals here, we can sell everything that we have. So it's just a mindset of how you go about uh, looking at the market. So I used to call it prospecting when I was doing selling. So is what you just described, Randy, the hunter part of it, is it prospecting or is it beyond that? Well, you gotta do both, right? Because hunting, you only, it's like, it, or fishing, right? Let's say you catch, you get a hook and you have an opportunity there, but then you have to prove yourself that you are a thinker, that you have passion for the industry, you're high energy, right? The, especially in this world, you have to have high energy, right? So like you have to have these pieces to close, right? Because at the end of the day, what matters for us is getting to close. So you can hook, but if you don't close, it doesn't really matter. And there's plenty of BD people out there that really love to network and they have so many friends and network, but they can never close. So you have to have all of these big fundamental pieces, I think, to be able to close. So um, I guess it is, it is prospecting is the first phase. Like for me, maybe I go down the Steam charts. It's, a, it's the charts of, it Steam's a big kind of game distribution uh, storefront, digital storefront. I can, I look down kind of the top 100. Anybody I don't know, huh, what are these guys doing? 
I better reach out, right? That's the hunting. But once you reach out, you better know their game. You better know something about the studio and then one, and then be able to talk the talk. Because if you don't, you're not gonna be able to close. So those are, to me, it's, it's a step-by-step -step all the way to close. And even after close, then you have to do the relationship management. That's when it's like everyone celebrates after, you know, at the close, but the hard work is actually even more after the close is working together and figuring out how to make it something. Right. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, what a lot of people do is they're not afraid to put their foot in the door, but if you put, put your foot in the door and you don't actually know what the next step is or know enough about the person behind the door and what they're trying to achieve, the foot in the door is not going to do anything. Right. So you really have to study before you even make the first reach out to Randy's point, know what that company is about. What do they care about? What are their goals? What are the objectives? As much as you can know about their, their roadmap or their vision or where they're going. So make sure you do your homework before you put your foot in the door. It's one thing to get in. It's another thing to close it, as Randy said. And that's really critical to hunters. Well, uh, it's almost exactly one hour since we started. Uh, I uh, thought I would take about an hour of your time asking my questions, but I am sure there are questions coming from the audience. So uh, people who are participating in this panel, please, uh, if you can uh, use the chat uh, facility we have and uh, put your questions in there, uh, I will be able to ask of uh, the, the uh, panelists those questions. So here is one question to both presenters. While the prevalence of work from home is predicted to be a lasting impact of COVID-19, what other maybe less obvious changes have your organizations made that you see lasting beyond the pandemic? Is, is the question clear? Let me read it again. While the prevalence of work from home is predicted to be a, long, a lasting impact of COVID-19, what other maybe less obvious changes have your organizations made that you see lasting beyond the pandemic? You know, start maybe with Randy. Yeah, I think the work from home for us is more about the team and communications, right? So I think in the last 70 days, we've, been, we've figured out how to communicate better as a group and, and to make sure there's alignment. The part that we're still figuring out, which I think is going to be changing is studio visits for us, right? And, and making an investment in a team because that one to me, and, and even hiring, I think, you know, we talked about that before on an earlier call uh, was, are, am I comfortable hiring someone without actually meeting them? And I'm not there yet because for me, if someone joins the team, it has to be a cultural fit and you need to be able to uh, kind of hang out together, right? For an hour and a half through lunch and be able to do that. And I, I, I've had some partners that are actually now virtually kind of figuring these things out. And for us, same with the studio. If we're gonna, you know, put millions of dollars in a studio and make an investment, you kind of want to go to the studio, you want to meet them, you want to be able to spend time with them and actually see what you're, you're, you're putting your money into. So those things now have kind of gone virtual. Uh, we are still moving forward with certain things and it's a virtual call. So I'm, I'm not as 100% comfortable as I was before, but I do think that, you know, uh, certain, certain, like these kind of criteria is going to evolve in how we do it. So instead of before, maybe it was just the business and we have another team that goes, lo looks at a studio We've actually bought in a third team that can virtually have calls with them and we get their input as well. So it's a little more, a couple more data points that before we didn't need because two teams are already in there. Now we have a third data point that helps and that can help better align to go, okay, let's, let's move forward. So um, I definitely think that there are going to be changes. Some is just the uh, comfort level of the manager. Some is comfort level or, or the organization because we all know we can't just not do anything, right? And we think there's a big opportunity ahead uh, during this time to kind of grow the business and grow relationships and things. So um, it's going to be uh, e kind of an evolution over time is, is how I see it. Great. And Michelle? Well, I think one of the keys that the key ones that stick out for me is just the, the need for more data, right? And so, as I said, we were already in sort of the early phase of 4G LTE to 5G transition. Um, and, you know, if you kind of go back in time, six to eight months, people, we're saying, well, why do I really need to move to 5G? What is that about? Now with everything online, all virtual, right? The need for more of that data throughput is, is, is really, you know, kind of showing itself. So I think you're going to see that 5G ex really accelerate, but it's not just 5G. It's the whole structure of d data center to edge, right? And if you see with more of us, more and more of us doing things online, being more virtual, I talked earlier about virtual events. Think about all of the opportunities there, especially if you think about AI, 
and machine learning and what can be done now with that. And you, you expand out from that, not just for events, but think about virtualization in a factory um, or AI in a factory, AI in medical um, use, right? So I think we're gonna see, we've seen some new usage models around this crisis that I think people are now looking at and saying, wow, do we see some op application now in other areas? And are we seeing an acceleration perhaps, perhaps of innovation because people now see, wow, I, we, we can do more like this. So, you know, let's apply it now and, and show how we can actually grow those innovations into other areas. So I think you're gonna see some of that. Um, the work from home is interesting too in another aspect because I think we're also seeing what can in fact be done virtually. So do I really have to get back on a plane as much as I used to? Now that's gonna have implications certainly on the, on the airline industry, on the hotel industry and so forth. But I think companies are going to increasingly look at that. And by the way, it will also have effect on potentially physical assets. If I don't need my workforce in a building, right? If I can get efficiencies with my workforce uh, work from home and they're okay with that, do I need physical assets, right? Do I need a building or are there some you just need? We, we're a foundry, we need a fab, that's how we make things, right? but do I need a physical office building? So I th think you're going to see some of those effects come along as a result of this. And I, I don't know what the right answer is, but I think it's going to be interesting watching that evolution. Again, at glass half full, I think there's, you're gonna see a lot of innovations come out of that that are gonna be spurred because we have this new way of looking at the world. Great, great. <laughs> Other questions from uh, our students? And as they are thinking about it, <clears throat> one of the things that, uh, oh, there it is, uh, to both presenters, have you seen any drastic change in the aspects that went into the decision-making at the top in your industries because of the current crisis? I'll repeat it. Have you seen any change, drastic change, in the aspects that went into the decision-making at the top in your industries because of the current crisis. We start with Michelle on this one. Yeah, I mean, actually, interestingly, I think the biggest one for me would be this idea of can people work effectively from home? Uh, it was a big topic of discussion uh, at our executive levels, and there was still very much a feeling that no people needed to be in an office, right? It, with the exception of the sales force, which tends to be more virtual because you're out of customers, um, which is hap happens to be where I sit, but you know, there's the sense of, no, we need to consolidate, we need to get everybody in an office, right? That's where we do our best work. And I think there's been a, a, a big mind shift around that because I think people realize, well, you know what? We've been actually highly efficient having folks, you know, work from their home office and there is a way to do this well. Um, and that's been very interesting because it's also spurred a lot of conversation around flexibility of work. And we have a huge, uh, focus in global foundries around diversity inclusion, which our CEO and our SLT or senior leadership team are, are particularly passionate about, uh, which I love, and I've been quite involved in. And so, you know, this idea of is there fle more flexible arrangements we could have, because now I don't have someone in office, I do have work from home during this crisis that's sort of uh, been on the forefront as you have, you know, say, for example, parents struggling with their kids trying to learn from home and they're trying to work from home. How do we make it flexible for people? How do we do that in, in a mindful manner? Um, and that, but still make sure that folks are motivated and if you know, they're, they're getting their work done and we've seen, yeah, that's absolutely possible. So I think that's very interesting to me. So I think there's a lot of aspects of that that um, are going to be revisited and relooked at. Um, and I do think that there's been a mind shift around that. Randy? Yeah, I think um, obviously Michelle talked about the, the work environment and how that's shifting on how people are changing about the sentiment of work from home. And yeah, it's you know, Jack Dorsey, right? Twitter and Square, you can work from home forever. We're not there yet either. Uh, we see kind of a transition that front, but from an in industry's perspective, you know, nothing's really changed for us. Uh, we are still moving forward with our strategy and planning that we've had over the last you know year or two years. So um, everything is is kind of, moving forward. I don't, and I think it's just because of kind of 
strong balance sheets of companies that, that have free cash flow. But they're not going to, if they believe the right business direction is what it was six months ago, this thing shouldn't change it. Um, so we're still moving forward. So I think from, a, from an industry perspective, perspective in games, I haven't seen any changes yet. Um, the only thing I've seen is just some delays in closing certain things because people can't be together. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I think the, the bigger businesses who have, have who had a strategy in January and February has the same strategy in March, April, or May. I think it's just trying to evolve how the internal how the internal teams work together and how do us and our partners work together. Excellent. And and one of the things as other people are thinking about this, one of the things that I always uh, found interesting was, uh, you know, business development. S some people. Uh, worry about what the profession is all about and is it like selling encyclopedias uh, door to door that's the first <laughs> fear that they have because they are not that's not what they want to do but having been in that yeah, area for a while and having done that i thought it was just one of the most enjoyable professions to be in because you uh, really get to share uh, your company's uh, products with somebody who has a problem, actually solve a problem for somebody uh, who has an issue. And and uh, by that, by doing that, you develop a nice relationship with them as well. So I, I'll come back and ask a question about the profession itself because I have a, a question here for both of you. Uh, <clears throat> what do you see most challenges, challenging thing as leader of a team in people management? especially some projects used to carry out offline before, now they're online. And how would you go about doing this? What's your advice on this? How do you manage a team when things shifted suddenly from doing everything uh, in person to online? Uh, is there special management skills that you need to develop to make that happen? Uh, kind of relates back to something that you said, uh, Michelle, where selling virtually is a skill that you need to develop because it's going to become more normal. Uh, so that's probably the question that's coming up. Uh, what, what are the challenges being a leader of a team and managing people in these kinds of projects that used to be done in person, now they're being done virtually? Uh, Randy? Uh, yeah, I can start. I guess, you know, I, I talked about it in the beginning of this call was that uh, the weekend before GDC, we have our family summit. It's, a, it's where we bring all our investees from the West and even from Asia now that comes into a, a, a forum where there's two days of, of speaking and everyone shares. We, we've had um, you know, multiple, like Steve Young spoke at it. We've had uh, um, just, just lots of outside people just to come and learn. That was all offline in the real world. Uh, and I have a person on my team that that's what she does. She plans these big kind of big events that we have and it was all offline. So. Um, we had to shift her responsibilities. She went to triage mode to see what she can cancel, what was cancelable in the contracts, see how much money we can recoup, uh, what gets pushed out to next year, and had to go through a big, it was probably a month of triaging to try to figure out all these vendors that she had worked with now is gone to nothing. Uh, and she can't, you know, we're not executing it anymore. To then a quick pivot to online. And I think Michelle mentioned change management because we did our first online, what we call, you know, 10 cent family summit. We called it the home edition, uh, <clears throat> virtual home edition to kind of do it that way, right? So we did a whole 180 pitch uh, and a swing. And then we basically did a home edition part one, which we did in uh, March. And we're gonna do a part two in July, which is kind of return to work, right? What are people seeing and everything else? And, and so I think she took it great, the, the girl on my team. And I think for us as, as managers, you just have to be, you just have to roll with the flow, right? It's not a, it, you know, it's, it wasn't great we did that. It wasn't good that the thing got canceled and I was very disappointed and, and all our partners were, but you have as kind of the, the manager, you have to just be positive. You have to make the change and you have to move on and execute. And I think if the team sees that, they're gonna go with go along with you, right? If, if we spend so much time going, oh my gosh, now we're, what are we gonna do this? We didn't do this thing. It, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for the team. It doesn't work for team morale. Uh, so we just did a quick switch. We went virtual. We got the content ready. We went ready to go. And she did an awesome job, right? So in my mind, her virtual summit was just as good as her offline summit. And, and we're off and running. So um, I think it's just to be positive and keep pushing forward and, and change quick and go. Right. Great. Great. Michelle? Yeah, I think, you know, good management is good management. I think the bottom line is you you set priorities. Your team knows what their what their their roles and responsibilities are. You set priorities, you manage to those priorities, and then you, you know, you let your people go and do their best work. 
Um, and that doesn't change whether you're in person or whether you're virtual. What does change though, is I think people during this time, especially, there's a little bit of fear, uncertainty and doubt. So you wanna make sure that you're touch pointing. And so one of the things that I did is I started a virtual coffee clutch, right? So, you know, once a week we would get together and I said, I don't wanna hear any business. This is not a, a meeting for business. This is literally like we met in the hall with a cup of coffee. How was your weekend? What are you doing this weekend? You, and that's what we did. I mean, we one of one of our uh, one of my uh, ladies who worked for me. One of her, her her children happened to play the violin. She said, "Oh, can one of you know, my kid my you know daughter come and play the violin for us for once?" So we did that, right? And so it was it was, it was really fun, and it was just a you know relax, have a cup of coffee, shoot the breeze check in, just make sure everybody's okay, you know, maybe have a chuckle, send some, you know, you know talk, talk about what w was fun this week, or, you know, what are you doing for the weekend or whatnot, and, you know, just have a touch point, so people feel, you know, like it's normal. If you were in the office, you'd be meeting in the hallway, you'd be meeting over lunch, you'd be, you know, at the water cooler, or whatnot, just have a check-in, but I think basic management skills don't change. Make sure the team knows what their job is, they know what what their priorities are, they know how it fits within the strategy of the company, and you give them all the support for them to go and do their best work. Great, great. Here's an interesting question for both presenters. So if you got a do-over and you just graduated with your MBA now and have to approach this changing job landscape, what would you do differently than you did in the past? Where would you start, uh, Michelle? Well, I'm not sure I would do things differently. I would do more of. So, you know, listen, at the, the end of the day, it's a very different world than it was when I graduated in 1995. You know, it's a long time ago. Um, but the, 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 one of the things that stays the same is network, 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 network. Use everybody you know, talk to everybody you know, and network, right? Um, I think it also goes back to something Randy said earlier, which is what is your passion? right? Really understand what your passion is. Listen, you work a huge part of your life. I, I, it, actually funny that you talked about, you know, selling as a profession and we'll get to that, but I started selling Christmas cards door to door when I was 12. That was my first job, right? Believe it or not, in those days, you had to sell Christmas cards in July if you wanted them pre-printed. And that's what I did. Every July was my Christmas money as I went and sold Christmas cards door to door. So I've been working for many, many years. And if you don't enjoy what you do, it, it's, you're going to burn out. You're not going to have a fun life, right? Because we spend so much time working and doing. So, you know, it's the old saying, which is do something you love and you won't work a day in your life. It's true. So first of all, figure out what your passion is. Second of all, once you figure that out, network, talk to everybody, you know, figure out the industry, figure out who you know, who's even somehow connected to the industry. If, even if it's a friend of a friend of a friend, Make LinkedIn your friend, right? Make sure you have a LinkedIn profile. It's how everything is done these days. Um, you know, make sure you talk to everybody you know on LinkedIn. Reach out. Don't be afraid to reach something that's beyond your reach. Don't be afraid. Just, just do it. Just apply for it. Even if they say you need two or three years of experience and you don't have it. So what? As my mother used to say, if you don't ask, it's still going to be no. So you may as well ask. You might get a yes. It's a 50-50 chance. So just you know, just do everything that you can and don't be afraid to step up and, and get outside your comfort zone. Um, and, you know, I, there's so many more tools now than when I was coming out of the program uh, online that I, I think actually it's, uh, it's a, it might be a little bit easier during normal times. Of course, these aren't normal times. So just don't be afraid to reach out and talk to people. Mm -hmm. Great. Great, thank you. And Randy? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I actually think about it a lot because you know, when I left, uh, when I graduated, it was right around the dot-com bust. I decided to try a dot-com thing that it ended up busting. Um, and I think when I graduated, I wasn't exactly sure what I liked, right? It was, I was an engineer. So for me, it was like time to switch. This is the MBA's, my opportunity to switch a career. But I wasn't sure exactly what that was. So, you know, I went to a web hosting company, you know, building out data centers in Asia. And then I went to finance, I did a startup, I did consumer products. Um, so, and then th that startup ended up getting acquired. So I was doing kind of product development outsourcing. So I was kind of all over that map in my, in my BD world. Um, and, I, and then I've kind of fi found gaming. And the only reason I was, I was lucky enough because I just saw an, uh, an art, uh, a job that was about kind of 
uh, a company had just raised money and they wanted to expand in Asia. And I was like, well, shoot, I've had experience there. We were building data centers out there. I'm, I'm bilingual. Uh, I can see both sides. I really did a, a lot of research about kind of that gaming company. And that was kind of my first move in. Uh, and I got the opportunity. It, it was really wasn't my, my gaming experience that got me in, but it was my kind of my pan Asian business that got me in. Um, and that was just from, a, you know, they had raised money and the CEO, I talked about what their initiatives were and it was growing their business in Asia, right? So I was lucky enough to get that opportunity. And I always ask myself now, but could, you know, cause I've loved my last 10 years of, of gaming and I wish I did it 10 years earlier. I just didn't know that was what I enjoyed. And I think, you know, when I mentioned passion and, and Michelle mentioned again, like you should figure out what is it you love. And even if you're watching, like if you're, if you watch stocks and like other companies you love and admire and, and what is that product? And if you love it, um, that will show in an interview. So, you know, do your research, look at the competition, look at how their, their product is right. And kind of go down that, that route, because I wish I did. I wish I got into gaming 10 years earlier. I went a really roundabout way to get there. And it was kind of by accident. Uh, and I didn't realize it was kind of my passion. But you know, Randy, it was a happy accident because you, you also said you didn't, you, you, you wasn't really gaming that got you in. It was this other experience and you still took the step and you still applied and you still, you know, pushed to do it. And, and I think that's awesome. And I, I try to always tell people, don't, don't look at a, a job description or, a, you know, an opening and say, oh, well, it's close, but I don't really have all the experience. So I'm not going to apply. Don't just don't ever do that. Right. Just just try. Right. If it's something you really want, you're really passionate about it. The, the least that will have, well, they could just say no outright, right? Or you could even follow up and say, listen, maybe I'm not right, but can I at least have an informational you know, session with the HR executive to, to understand what I would have needed to succeed? Because you'll learn so much from that. And then the next time you might be more prepared. So don't, don't, let, don't let, ever let that get in your way. Just, just try, you know, yeah. just take that step. And, and, you know, Randy, you're a perfect example of that. I mean, you, you took the step and look what happened, right? So I just, I, I hope everybody takes that to heart and really just don't be afraid to try. Great. So Randy, this is a question for you. In the absence of sports, esports has seen a surge of popularity during COVID-19. Do you see this being maintained after the return of sports or will there be a correction? Do you see esports gaming moving into other areas like gambling? Yeah, so there's when you say correction, there's valuation correction, which um, you know there's a lot of non-gaming money going into esports, and a lot of it's from professional sports, like you know the the Pittsburgh Steelers or the Warriors or, or Robert Kraft and the and the Patriots. Like a lot of money is going into esports teams from there um, because you know they have franchises that's worth billions of dollars. I think there's a difference though, because the, the king of the esports is the actual, the game itself. So Riot has its own esports league and the king of all these leagues isn't really the team. It's not Team Liquid, but it's actually League of Legends, right? So um, I think it's a little bit different than, than how those guys view esports because they kind of view it from what they're used to, which is the NFL, the NBA, you know, the MLB. Um, but uh, so I, I think Valuations are, are a little are high for an esports team specifically. Um, there's a lot of ecosystems that are built around esports, and that one to me is interesting. There's also money going in there because everyone seems to think this esports thing is huge. For Tencent, you know, we're focused on the game and the content because if you don't have that, and we get a lot of pitches, oh, this will be a great esports game. We have this design, this design for esports, but the game isn't any good. So if the game's not any good, there's not going to be any esports around it, and it's all going to fall crumble apart. So we really focus on the core of the game. Uh, do you see esports gaming moving into other areas like gambling? So uh, definitely yes. Um, DraftKings, as you know, it does regular sports gambling, but also into esports gambling. I was meeting with some executives at MGM, uh, and I you know, probably meet with them once a year, and they're trying to figure out what to do with their casino floors because the slot machine is for older female demographics that are playing slot machines. Eventually that group is going to age out and they're going to have a lot of floor space. So they're trying to figure out, well, how do we get into esports for the next generation? Should we put, be putting in a, a 5v5 kind of a, a PVP play that you can gamble on yourself and play, play around 
in a casino. So um, I definitely believe that there is going to esports will move into uh, to gambling. Great. Let me, uh, because we are coming very close to 6.30, I wanted to see if you had some uh, final comments. Uh, what kinds of things do you want our students to be doing now? Getting ready for, you know, let's say a business development job. Uh, as I had said earlier, uh, there is, there is a, a misconception sometimes about what business development is. Uh, and, and I do remember, uh, the first thing I learned uh, in, in, in this profession was, you are not asking for a favor from your client, you're doing a favor to your client because the client is the one who has the problem. And so that changes the mindset completely where you start enjoying now because you're not there to beg for a sale, you're there to solve a problem. So how should the students who are looking into business development as a potential opportunity train themselves to do this? Uh, what are the kinds of things you would want them to do from now on for the next few months at least as they prepare themselves for a career in business development? Uh, so maybe start with Michelle. No, I think that's a great way to look at it. You are solving a problem. <clears throat> and so when you look at that career and wherever you're looking, whatever company or industry you're looking in, that, that is a really a great mindset um, because I think I think do I do think too often if you you talk to folks who say you either love to do sales or business development they hate to do sales and business development right and you think of yourself as a consumer right you you feel like you are being pushed to purchase something and the only reason you feel that way is you probably just don't have a need right if you truly have a need and you value something it's it's not a pushy sale right it's someone helping you solve a problem, something, someone helping you with something that you need. And so I think that is definitely a mindset. If you're going to go into sales or business development, that is absolutely the way that you have to approach it. Um, and you also have to not be afraid to put yourself out there and be, and be kind of front and center. Um, you can't be afraid to talk to somebody new or strike up a conversation with someone you don't know or learn more about a business or an industry that you don't know about and how you do that research. So I would, I would say if this is something you're thinking about, kind of really, um, really dig into yourself and make sure that you're comfortable with those types of things. That, that's, those are the, definitely the characteristics you need if you wanna be successful in the field. Um, and if you are already going into it and you know that that's your focus and you have an industry or company in mind, again, just make sure you do your homework, not just about the company you're gonna go work for, but who are their customers. Who are their potential customers? Who are their partners? And start to do your homework now because you're going to need to know the background for all of that to do a good job in that role. So, um, you know, be curious, be, you know, willing to put yourself out there and really be a problem solver because that's really what you are. And if you approach it as a problem, as solving problems, it, it won't feel like you're, you know, begging for business. You're there to help. Right, and that's that's really valuable to to your customers. Right, Randy. You know, when I think about my team, I have kind of three groups. One of them is just DevRel, and my DevRel team is are the hunters, right? Those are the ones going out there, looking for new opportunities, filling up the funnel, and looking for interesting games that we can look at. And then I have kind of my key accounts, and those are the ones that are managing the major publishers and you know more of the the farmers. And a lot of times when I hire folks, or even when I interview people, I try to see what kind of personality they are. Because I've over time figured out my personality and I used this in, in an interview once, which was, you know, if you were to hire me in business development, I'm not the guy who's gonna go to a conference and come back out with a hundred business cards, right? Because I'm not that social. And so if I'm not that social, can I be good at business development? And I still think I can. And, the, and what I said was like, I'm not gonna be that guy that, that's gonna come back with a hundred business cards. What I'm going to be is that guy that before I went into the conference, figured out who's all going to the conference, figured out what my company does, what I need to get, you know, what, who would be the best partners, and go find those five people. And I'd come back out with five business cards. And I got the job. So I guess that was the right answer. And it, it took me a while to figure that out because I am not that social of a, of a person in an open room. But uh, I think if you have that thinking ability, and you still like to be with people and you like to meet with people, but you just don't want, you're not a, 
you know, meet 20, 30 people and, and, and just a volume kind of guy. And there are people like that. And those are great for my DevRel people. Like my DevRel guys, they're like that. They know everyone in the industry. They want to talk. They want to know what's going on. And they're a great source of just information and deal flow. Uh, but you don't have to be that guy. You could be the other person, right? A guy or a gal, right? That's more strategic about their thinking. Because again, once you get the hook, you have to be able to close and you have to be able to think. Um, and I think that's that I think everyone looking into a business development role has to figure out what are they strong, what are they strong at and what's the right, right fit. Because when you're looking for the job, you know, you may have to, you know, angle towards whichever one you think you're better at because the, the, the person interviewing you will, will know. Excellent. Uh, we are almost there, 6.30 p.m. First, uh, let me say thank you on behalf of the Graduate School of Management for uh, spending uh, 90 minutes with us today, uh, telling our students the kinds of things we should be uh, looking at into the future as the COVID-19 crisis uh, you know, keeps unfolding. Also, the skills that they need in business development, the kinds of mindsets that they should have uh, when they go in there. Uh, I, 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 I also want to mention to the students uh, that it's not just the fact that you've participated in the panel. Uh, you know, each of you has done different things uh, for GSM. Uh, uh, you, you, Randy, you know, you hosted our students when they went there. Uh, you took resumes and interviewed our students trying to figure out if there are job opportunities for them. Michelle, you serve on the Dean's Advisory Council. Uh, you know, when I reached out to you and we had a Bay Area student who had uh, a job situation you immediately interviewed her and then you know, good things happened after that. So I want to say thank you on behalf of GSM for not just you know, being here today, but the fact that we have the freedom to approach you like this and ask you for these favors because you make it happen for us. So thank you again very much for giving us uh, this time in the evening. And uh, thanks to all the students who are here as well. Yeah.